work. And I do that and encourage you all to always put the works as close as possible in time to the works that you're dealing with. The way here, that you found, composed between 239 and 265, which is quoted by the case of the in his comment to the Sambo. He writes that when completed, the vast work of Huang Lan was stored in the Imperial Palace Library. It was organized into more than 40 sections, with each section containing several dozen chapters. And the total text is said to have amounted to more than 8 million characters. Now, there are a number of remarkable features of the work and its production. Firstly, the speed with which it was achieved, less than two years. To be able to achieve their purpose in such a short period of time, it appears that the Han Dynasty Imperial Library was available to the compilers, and that it was very well stocked. Secondly, the relative youth of the five principal members of the editorial group were more or less contemporary with the newly enthroned emperor. Yu Shao, who we otherwise remember as the author of the Grand Monster, was born between 168 and 172 and died between 240 and 249, which means that he was only 50 years of age in 220, and he was the chief editor. Wei Dan, another editor, was 40 years of age, and Miao Xi was only 34. We don't know much about the ages of the other two principal editors, but they were, must have been under 40 years of age. But the majority of the editors were comparatively young and lived on for 20 or 30 years after the completion of the work. This also, I can suggest, something noteworthy. And third, the scale of the book was hitherto unheard of, being, for example, more than 15 times the length of the Shichi and almost double the size of the later encyclopedia entitled the Titan Mila, which we shall come to soon. This encyclopedia, compiled between 977 and 983, consists of only 1,000 chapters, organized into 55 sections, and it contains excerpts from 2,500 works, but only 4.5 million Chinese characters. When we consider that the Huang Lan was almost double the size of the Titan Yuan and completed in one third of the time, the immensity of the undertaking is striking in full clear. Regrettably, the Huangla is long lost to us. You use it for. Uh, no, I didn't use it. You didn't use it. Any interest in engraves would be interesting since the only section which we have remaining, of it, or predominantly, they tell us where imperial graves were located. This was perhaps a subsection of a subsection. And these extant quotations concern funeral rituals and the sites of the tombs of previous generations of rulers and statesmen stretching all the way back to and including the emperor. I would suggest that this encyclopedia, by its structure, set the prototype for later encyclopedia. What we would see happen during the coming centuries, we look at the Jin Dynasty forward. Times of internet and strife and destruction. And at the end of this destruction, the creation of an encyclopedia to gather again the lost information. At the same time as it was gathered, it was structured. And it was structured at a certain Topics which may or may not have been those used in the Panda, but became quite rigid for the time. I don't remember if I brought you a slide of all those headings, because that was what not my intention. So I probably did it. If I just say in one or two words about the sort of headings that we find in the encyclopedia, relying, for example, upon that major work, the Ewen Lage, from its hand in the which I'm sure some of you have used, it starts off with heavenly people, 
teachers progresses as we might expect to earthly or ge geographical features, deals with emperors and kings, moves on there, thereafter to man, and then descends step by step through human activities such as ritual behavior, such as official positions, such as the construction of bridges, buildings, into war, and thereafter clothing, food, uh, vessels and boats, foodstuffs, divination, literature, and then enters the realm, the natural realm, with fruits, grains, all sorts of products which were edible and less edible in the animal kingdom, ending with insects. That became the structure of information. The next thing that would happen would be that the Tang Dynasty would eventually collapse. They would be followed by a period of dynasties, and then in the early Morgan Sun, once again, an attempt to reconstruct the knowledge that once existed. Much knowledge was lost forever. For example, machinery, devices perhaps of the same sort that we saw in Japan, was lost forever. No one knew how to use them. But certain information did remain. When we look, for example, at this slickest fragment, which I asked you today, Peru's, we're typing you that. It's about bamboo. And it does contain one of these things which is rather odd. On the face of it, it's 12 quotations drawn from China's wonderful historical literature about bamboo. Why those twelve? And why only those twelve? In other words, there was a certain constriction on the amount of information that could be provided under each head. It was like that city, a little ward of its own. Understandably, we begin with the area and Marshall and the Ali, and then we move into historical sources, which we heard of yesterday in Dunhua Huan, Dunhua Hanji. Very nice. The Shu Jin and Yi Ji. The rare. Then we move into philosophy. The Mutra Chun Chu. Nice. The Huayang Guo Chu. The work which we, we could treat as a, an imbecile. Yeah. And then what we can call the non orthodox histories, the Jin Zhong Wu. Yes. Tu Guo Xian 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 Zhuan. Interesting work. Work 11 is what interests me most of all. The Tsun Hu, and I wonder who is, any of you has ever had the need to have a look at it. How many of you have ever eaten bamboo shoots? I suppose well, not only you, I think, I think nearly everybody here. Bamboo shoots are rather delicious. And here we have the entire pool. Well, but what's that, that, what is a pool, by the way? It's a sort of little book containing the inside the pool. We have a true pool, a true pool. We have all sorts of pools. True pool, look at, like I true. But this is the true And if we think when this book was written, the typing year, which was going to be a collection in its turn of pre modern, talking modern, seven books, literature, which ends with Lu Wei Long's poetry. What is the Sun Kuo and why is it there? Of course it should be there, I don't understand that, but it is definitely part of the Sun, which is part of the subtitle of June that I'm talking about. But it was written almost at the same time as the encyclopedia was being compiled by a monk called Zan Ying. And when you do quote this passage that's being up in the Taiping Yu Lao, you find Sun Kuo and it says such and such. You may think that you're quoting Sun Fu, but that passage actually, as it stands here, doesn't exist 
in the world. This is the only quotation from the Sunni. And it is in itself a compilation of line one, or page one, page 29, different lines cut and pasted together with the footnote. So that even inside each item which is quoted, you will find that they are not exact quotations. They are reconstructions of information. A bridge, maybe more concise. I tend to think of it as somewhat as like boiling down a stock to a very, very, very condensed essence of knowledge. Who would use the type of Mila encyclopedia? Well, it would be people who were preparing encyclopedic examinations. Because, of course, they were required to have encyclopedic knowledge, which was impossible. The first reader, of course, for the type of Mila was the emperor, who so enjoyed the book that he read three chapters a night and finished a thousand drive in less than a year. It wasn't his only book he produced. This book was the type of Yulab was produced by going back to and drawing out extracts from previous Tan and even pre-Tan encyclopedia, including the Panla, which by then was almost lost. There was also another work which some of you may have used the Taiping Wangji, which was created by anecdote, looking at Biji Shao Shuo and other alternative forms of literature, the non-standard forms of literature. It would also be backed by the large institutional um, encyclopedia Su Fu Yuan work. And there we're very lucky to have a fragmentary edition of the original way from the Northern Song Dynasty. But, once again, what would happen to this job of creating information, of distilling information, of structuring information? We're going to come back in a little while and look at alcohol. A wonderful topic. But I thought I would just like to move on to some rather rare books which you may not have been able to consult, which are popular Ming Dynasty daily encyclopedia. There is one set published in Japan. Do we have it here in? We do. I do. Um, if anybody wishes to come to learn, you can look at it. These books are great fun. Um, this, first of all, is the front of speech. The ladies and I want you to read Wonderful popular encyclopedia. And I'm actually going to show you its contents list to allow you to compare it to what I told you. What's the contents list from the email? But before we do that, I'd like to go into a little look at what this nice East End penny is like. Um, I don't want to make too much of it. But publishers have been variously printing or cutting blocks for encyclopedia, but they often based on old works, and then they, from that they have selected one tenth and left out the greater part of what they found. So there was also a selection process ongoing in the information. And there was a fierce competition, which this preface tends to suggest. And of course, we want to say that our book is what, by far the best book, and we find everything we needed. What did it contain? And we are dealing here with a one-lead work. How is it structured? 
how the information becomes structured by this time. Chen Wen, this chapter. Yi, two, Ren Qi, number three, Shu Ling, number four. It's exactly what one would expect. The great difference, of course, is that it is illustrated. This is the illustrations which show how progression of knowledge went. Remember that we have now moved almost 1,000 years forward in time. China, we have marriage, we have funeral ritual, we have um, all sorts of important things referring to life. Earlier, or 
simultaneous uh, encyclopedia. His encyclopedia is interesting in that it displays personal idiosyncrasy, which is much greater than anything found in any state sponsored publication. And I'm particularly interested in this passage, the Thousand Days. This story, which I'm sure you've heard before, quite well known. There was a certain mountain, Bhutan mountain, and on that mountain there was a certain tavern. And that tavern grew a fierce drink. If you drank it, you stayed drunk for a thousand days or so long. And a poor individual called Charlie Person, he drank it, and he did in fact. Into a comatose state for a thousand days. In such that, the story goes on, if you read the Bowl of Truth and earlier times, he was buried because everybody was dead. And the wine vendor thought, oh, that's sure I'm sure he had that alcohol. Yeah. I wonder how he is, I'll go around and see him. I went around to his house and found the man dying three years previously. He said, no, no, he's not dead, he's just drunk. They went and opened a few. There he was. What's interesting is here that I actually selected one part of the story. One part of the story. And we're supremely lucky. We are supremely lucky in that in Duhuang there is preserved very, very, very rare relation. And let me just find exactly where I want to be. It's very bad. Um, Among them, if you are interested in the history of the encyclopedia, 
you must use a standard point of departure. The Jungle Buddha in the of the Great Buddha Jin. He will give you the standard set of encyclopedias from the Pongola up into the Taiku Yulai and the early, I think he goes to the end of the north. He, he covers up to the northern south. Thereafter, if you wish to know how many hundreds and perhaps even thousands of glaciers exist, you would have recourse, for example, to a book like the Glacial Yubien. There are many such works, but we still do not actually have one standardized work which covers the entire period. Just one thing I put if you wish to look at, as you will do undoubtedly, pharmacopoeia, then one of you was working on something related to pharmacopoeia. Who was it? What? Yes, you. Me, yes. Yes. Then you will use Unschuld's writings from beginning to finish, I assume. <laughs> because this work, which is, is, if you want to know about what actually is in the uh, the variety, the various um, leishu, this content-wise is one. What we have here is the Dome Bonsai from the early Northern Sun. And again we're looking at how knowledge is structured, not so much what it says, but how it says. What you will have is, for example, for alcohol, you'll have Fundamental description followed by quotations, each of a certain, of a roughly maximum length of one or two lines in a commentary. Again, the information is severely limited and structured. We may will not have time to explore the entire content, but I can assure you that it ranges over the same sort of information that you would expect to find within a Tsongshu. Quotation after quotation after quotation, but on this occasion, not from historical work, not from literary works, not from works of philosophy, but from preceding, preceding um, pharmacopoeia to a greater extent. What's good about this, and is good about many other such writing is that they identify the sources. They identify the sources. And you see, if you are interested in alcohol, interested in the way in which the presentation of information about its benefits, therapeutic benefits, this is structure. But as you'll see, if you just look here, each passage is reduced to a certain way, reduced to a certain way, reduced to a certain way. If you wish to have an entire work upon a subject, you will turn to the Jiu There being several in existence. An enlarged encyclopedia or mini encyclopedia focusing on one specific topic. If we follow the line of, given by Okunishi Tameto, we can see how, as with the encyclopedia, there was a continuum beginning with the earliest work. Because here we're talking about the Shandong Ban Bansao, all the different editions which continue in a single line, leading, for example, through the Zhong Hu Xin Xiu, Jin Shi Zhong Lei Ben Sao, Bei Ben Ben, Bei Ben Sao, codifying the information, structuring the information, and exerting, I would suggest, a, an implicit thought control, deciding this is what we know, this is not what we know. All within one paradigm, all within the 
idea with the five elements theory. Knowledge that which would lay outside was not permissible. In the same way, when you came to the great Tokyo while there have been different traditions, still you find works repeating, copying, enlarging, amending, but still continuing same tradition. When you said, from the, throughout the soul, through the year, through the means. This would mean that for 1,500 years, roughly, one concept was developed and developed and refined and codified and constructed in one way. I would suggest this also happened in the legal system. Now, I don't know if any of you uh, would claim to know much about the legal system. Has anybody read the Tan Lee? You've read the Tan Code. Excellent. Although it may be... Well, I would, I would personally not think it was, was a sort of book which would put you to sleep, because it will horrify you <laughs> repeatedly. But this in, derives, of course, from the Qin Dynasty Code, which derived from the Han Dynasty Code, which derived ultimately from a modification of the Qing Dynasty Code, which had its origins in previous times, which we don't really know. One of the, what we heard, as we've seen that there were traditions which were amended, both in the encyclopedia and the pharmacopoeia, adding, codifying, structuring, in the legal system similarly, there was a trunk, a tree trunk, the code. And then there were regulations, Li and Li. A simple book which will help you to move around if you ever get, and one day your students may ask you when you're teaching somewhere about the law, is for example, Zhongguo Kudai Fali Lin Zhu There are many other such books. But you'll find that there are a rather large number of books about the law. What's interesting about the law is that there was an idea, first of all, that the code was inviolable. But the regulations came and went with time. The ultimate idea being that for every possible crime, there was a paragraph somewhere in the legal system and an applicable punishment. Now, what do you know of the punishments available, for example? Would you care to, anybody care to just suggest something which, one or two words which encompass them? must be deprived of something. If you have committed a crime, you will be deprived of something. You get what the simplest, you'll be deprived of some of your sessions. You must pay a fine. If you're unable to pay a fine, or if the crime does not allow conversion to a fine, your physical condition will be confined. You will be beaten. You will be beaten between the low level, the very high level, by a range of instruments. If that has not been sufficient punishment, after your beating, a kang will be placed around your neck. This is a heavy ball. Your crime will then be written on board, and you must wear it for a month. The board is sufficiently large to not enable you to feed yourself. So it's both 
guilty from your neck. Therefore, you must be fed by somebody else. If that is not sufficient, at the end of that, you will be further confined by having your liberty taken away from you, that you will be sent away from your community, to another community, at a certain distance. Thousand leave, two thousand leave, three thousand leave. And that choice of where you will be sent may specifically be to guarantee that you do not survive. You will be sent as a military slave to the borderlands, in the far south, in the far north, in the far west. If none of these are sufficient punishment, you will be deprived of your life by execution, strangulation, or, the worst part, decapitation. In earlier times, castration was punishment, but this was thought to be inhumane. Other forms of punishment also existed. You were going to them, but they were rare in number. But all those vicious in nature. What is very, 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 very interesting is that each punishment had a value in money. It was all based upon money. Such a crime received, was worth such an amount of money and received such a punishment. Such was the structure. Again, this is a confining, restricting, controlling element to the way in which legal knowledge, as opposed to pharmacopoeia knowledge, or literary knowledge, or historical knowledge, was structured. Let's just take a very quick look at it. Now we're going to the Ming Code. The Ming Code is quite a pleasant code. Unpleasant. It's the whooshing of the tool. And we have here, because of course, ultimately my, my primary interest in modern time, in my modern time, is looking at punishment. <laughs> we have whipping, we have other forms of beating, we have whippings. If you will be whipped, or you will be beaten with me, robbed, or you will be sent away into. Um, exile. And they all correlate. Everything must correlate with one another. So we have vertical correlations. Now here you have strangulation, decapitation, which are the shin the ultimate punishments. These have scarcely changed since the time of yes. Everything is defined. These are the instruments of torture. As you will know, in the tribunal, not the court, the tribunal of pre modern Chinese law, torture of a restricted nature could be inflicted upon both those accused of crimes and those witnessing who have information. A little bit like this new nine hour rule by British British police force. They can take anybody, they can force you to answer questions. Um, there were stringent regulations about what you could and could not do, but again it was formulated and structured within a certain parameters which do not allow or should not allow particular um, differences. Not only were people treated differently, but as you can see here, it mattered who you were. Your punishment was also evaluated or structured by what function in society you if you were a guardian and stole, you were punished more severely than if you were a common person who stole. If you stole using violence, you were punished more 
harsh even than somebody who made a burglary. So there were different degrees. Everything was structured. Everything was reduced to a wonderful, massive mathematical system. And you see the numbers of parameters. Because everything could be reduced or calculated in strings of cash. This is something I have a great interest in, and in fact, enormous interest since the whole concept was challenged in 1492 by somebody who said, wait a minute, something's gone wrong. The value of the cash at the beginning of the <coughs> dynasty and today, 120 years later, is different. How can we use this as the basis for our punishment system? We should redefine the entire system. He was Minister of Justice. Did his appeal succeed? How many people think that it would be validity of a Minister of Justice of pointing out that the system was based was totally out of date and totally inapplicable and of course therefore violated all those Confucius and Confucian ideals. How many people think that such a memorial found imperial approval? Anybody? No. Well, unfortunately it didn't. Other points, yes, but not this. This was again something which would have become codified. It would become a structure. What the formal emperor had said it would stand for all seven. And just looking very, very briefly, again I wouldn't wish to tie you with this because I haven't got a wristwatch and I can't remember the time. If you do happen to read the law, you will see, for example, and this is an area which great interest in is because of the fact that we have these trolls on the internet, blogs. If you curse somebody, you will go, of course be whipped 15 times. If you curse each other, then you will be whipped, etc. You know, etc. Et there's a punishment for every crime. And if you go further on in the text, you will find that You get, as you would expect, pithy explanations explaining about everything, or exactly the same sort of type of content that you found in the later. But here we are dealing with the matters. Who gets punished? What? Like what the rank they have within society, what sort of office they have, the different I would suggest, this is my claim now, and I'm coming to my conclusion, and I'm looking forward to a lively and vigorous opposition from several of you, that this had a stultifying effect upon the development of thought about certain aspects. For example, popular encyclopedia, the way that knowledge was conveyed to all those at that median level of society, educated but not extremely educated, working with as functionaries within ministries, working as physicians, or working as clerks or even magistrates within law courts. This thing was constrained in the same way as these sort of illustrations are constrained. We have here, again, from another Ming Dynasty encyclopedia, text and illustration. The illustration is of one size, the text is of another size. This is not, this is, again, okay, we're now in a form of what we say, high latency or physical activity. This is how our, our county official or our county official
patient's heart is expected to maintain his health. Here, I believe such illustrations are being used by the video of Cohen. We see this link between structured information and image. Each one with its heading. Here, these are not identified by source since they are commonly shared information. Somebody had stretched outside of the box. You happen to know who it was? You do. Linnaeus. Linnaeus had a completely different idea of systematizing the world. Onoranzan's great work was forgotten and lost in these 20 years. It was completely Set this up. A paradigm shift occurred in Japan, which would then lead, in my belief, to the possibility when speech of technology was introduced a few couple of decades later, Japan was already conceptually aware that knowledge no longer had to be structured in the way that it had been structured for 1,500 years to reduce short pieces 
illustrations always follow the same pattern, copied from text to text to text, revised the edition, renewed the edition, amended the edition, whatever you could think differently. This would also happen, of course, with the Chinese and Japanese legal systems, the entire medical system, and eventually you will find that new encyclopedia, which derived from Western thinking, would be introduced into China. Whereas in Japan, they would develop their own encyclopedia. And what is most interesting to me was that, that box with those cables became the center of interest of the Japanese, and they wished to understand what was going on. So when it came to steamship technology, it was not just enough to say, ah, this is exactly what, if you just warm up steam, it will turn around. Enough. We've had that since the Sung dynasty. They said, wait a minute, how come we can do this and this and this? We must find out how to do this. In other words, they stretched themselves outside of the confines of knowledge that had been imposed upon them. Through the Chinese culture, for centuries. This is my problem, this is one of my explanations for why Japan had a great difficulty in modernizing in, this, in the 19th century. Now, you may disagree, but this is a theory, this is evidence, there are more examples I can produce, which shows that both this is one possible way it could have happened, and I believe it did. My contribution, I hope, lies within Popper's paradigm, but I, my information can be full. My result is falsifiable. You can show that by one point, one other point where they broke out of the box at some other point in time, at an earlier point in time, my ideas are wrong. The floor is yours now. To Thank you. Not even Nietzsche Jensen's 
And thereafter, he, his work was so influential, he took a Jesuit to take a step outside it. I don't think any Chinese would have, Chinese pharmacopoeia yeah. specialist, would have dared to transcend that work. That work became standard. I mean, it still is to a certain extent standard. The people work from it. But don't you, by, by producing that one example of tobacco, I can think of that the tobacco has been dealt with in a number of memorials. It's noxious or beneficial. Yes. But it has to be included in pharmacopoeia. Mm -hmm. pharmacopoeia. Of course, one of the problems being with it is that it did not have a specific location. One could also think of the question of opium. Mm -hmm. I don't think you'll find that kind of included, although it should have been. Um, in Japanese works, no, because of course, Randaku, the whole Dutch learning, um, there was an ongoing process, but the publication of works which were not written by Japanese, in Japanese, until very late.
and he was a made um, honorary doctor at Dunn University in, I think, 1981. And he came with the same jacket that he'd worn when he'd been invested in his professorship in 1932. Uh, he was a very remarkably fit and strong, wonderful old man, a large number of books, mostly for Brill. And we took him to the local museum and showed him all sorts of wonderful objects. And there was a there were bronze mirrors, and there was this, and there was that. There was texts, and one was presented to him. Somebody, not me, I'm very happy to say, said to him, Ah, Professor Abraham, what does it say there? He's, he's 80 years old. He's been a professor for 50 or something years. Let for him very carefully say, No idea. <laughs> you can't know everything. Your research cannot focus on everything. So you, yes, the question of Confucian perfectionism is a valid question, but within the framework of commercial public publishing, I think that it's, that there are two different areas. No, it's a good question. In the same way, it's a good question. Right. Work products which were not of Chinese origin incorporated at some point into the Chinese knowledge system? The answer tends to be, I think, no, unless done so by a non-Chinese author. And much later by a Chinese author. By and much later by the Chinese author. But it was probably uh, an isolated the, perhaps case. Perhaps you didn't know that the, the first writer was a Western and Yeah, yeah. You, yes. It was written really like in the professor, like, uh, I don't know the West, or yeah, just have the Chinese yeah, yes. name. And you... No, no, Tai Chi. Etc. So it was clear that he came from the West. <laughs> hmm? Please. Um, as you just explained, this knowledge system that um, came up, how far would you say did it trickle down in society? Because you said magistrates and doctors and like magicians. The professional class. Yeah, and also like. Builders and merchants and like how far would you go? How far would you say this That's kind of I mean. was influential? Like to which level of society? Here I have a, a problem in answering your question. I rely on extensive reading of court cases. People have done something wrong. If we set them aside and think about people who have done nothing wrong, normal people, they don't tend to leave written records. So I don't know very much about them. I don't know anything about them really in the Sun Dynasty or the Yuan, and very little about them. The Qing will begin to get me and who and other such family jackets. So I'm always looking at the accused. And by accused we mean the guilty. Because everybody who is accused is almost certainly de facto guilty. Although this is not necessarily the case, and we will find some other examples. I tend to use archival, handwritten material and legal compilations. How far did this sort of idea trickle down in society? Well, of course, it was like a... It was like a waffle iron impressed onto society. Most people knew that if they committed the crime, they would be punished. And they had a rough idea of what the punishment would be. But that did not deter them from committing crimes. People, amazing. I would meet you in a bar. We'd have a couple of drinks and you would say to me, I used to work in a treasury, in a, a mint, producing copper coins. And then I would say, well, I don't have much money. And then you would come along and we'd say, have you got any money? And we'd say, yes. 
I said, well, can we, borrow, can we use it as a start capital? And you'd say, yes. And then your technology, my will, his capital, and we would begin immediately, within a couple of days, to commit a capital offence and get caught and be executed. What we never find happening in any court case is any appeal to by the accused to Confucian values. They don't exist. It doesn't seem to have permeated into society, or at least it doesn't appear when people attempted to defend themselves. They, their defense is almost always, I was poor, I was drunk, I needed money. But the idea that they were somehow breaking taboos does not exist. Now, that, I may not have read enough, but I would say, therefore, that this was a, some, a framework which was laid out upon society, but it, nevertheless, when people acted, they often acted without thought for that framework. Family values, family to preserve the family, to preserve the clan, was much more important than the social norms, if you wish to begin to talk about code terms, imposed upon society. As a kind of laboratory case for these questions, and since now it's becoming subject again, the, the famine that came after the Great Leap Forward and the problems that were created during the Cultural Revolution when bureaucrats told farmers to plant things deeper or plant things closer or plant things over. The farmers obviously knew that it wouldn't work because they were experts in the land and in the land. But they followed what the bureaucrats said. Now, why? Why did they subordinate their own knowledge of nature? What was coming from this that this is a structure hmm. system of power? Was it because they believed they must know more because they were bureaucrats? Was it because they were afraid of punishment? Or that would be a kind of area where you might test to what extent their reaction was some kind of ancestral obedience to the system. Mm, that's a good point. The, 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 the educational campaigns of various sorts, the institutional campaigns, for example, we just focus on the Ming Dynasty, but this, they were very strong control of the way, for a certain levels of society, that one thought. The problem is that we only encounter reactions to this system when people break the law. When they combat, when they are, when they either break the law and are not discovered, or when they abide by the law and just carry out their everyday duties, they become invisible, much like us. This, unless the the events in some way are noteworthy, they will not even appear in a British Shafrock. They will definitely never appear in an encyclopedia. They will not get into the national histories. They will not appear in the in, in, in the very few records. You have to do something which breaks the norm. And normative behavior, I believe, has become quite strong. But it's interesting that you can find um, an ongoing differentiation of behavior between people who should behave in one way but behave in another way without apparently considering the consequences. This is some, one of my big questions. Why do people commit such terrible, such dangerous crimes when they know that they probably will get caught? I've, I've got no answer. Even after 10,000 cases, I've got no answer to this. Nobody ever explains that. Um, so, this is a very good question, but we just, we, I don't believe we will ever have any of that information because nobody ever wrote it down unless we forget our diet. Anything else? Anything else? There's one explanation about fox spirits. <laughs> <laughs> well, that takes us now. The next lecture, tomorrow's lecture, is it? Yes. Now, is there something else? Because otherwise, you are rapidly approaching the time to rest before.
this afternoon's because oh, now we're going to do we will be going on to the literary sources as historical sources. I mean, here we've just been dealing with how to structure the information. You know, the, the content of the information I haven't dealt with. Because each of you I've discovered knows so much about your specific subjects to try to add on more content will be like trying to fill a full glass of water. I wouldn't get anywhere. What I'm trying to do is change the form of the glass. From a square glass to a round glass to Four glass to four glass. That's all I can do. Nothing else. Anything? Yes? Yeah. Um, because in the picture show us, uh, I saw the guideline of calligraphy practice in the encyclopedia. Yes. Um, I want to know is there any um, anything about paintings? Because yes. in, there is? Of course there is. Okay. How to paint by numbers. <laughs> yes. Everything good. Another area that I have a strong interest in is just three words. I mean, there, there are three words which are so closely linked to one another you can't really get them apart. Mm. Creation, imitation, and forgery. Mm. But, um, so, when, if everybody wished to write all of swear, aren't you just? Mm. Everybody, everybody wished to write poetry greater than Sutra. That's wonderfully beautiful. But with some extra something. But you, to achieve, achieve that, you were told, because again, it was so difficult. The Yusha system was so difficult that you had to, first of all, read, 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 read memorize, 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 then start to imitate, 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 and then you could make that breakthrough Innovate. But too often that breakthrough never occurred. <laughs> and therefore, in painting as well, of course, there are painting manuals. Painting is taken up in these, especially since these daily encyclopedia were meant for the newly educated professional classes. They weren't going to be great painters, they just wanted to be able to paint. And then it's all the how to do Southful, how to do Shinful, how to write everything, how to write perfect characters. All that you needed, but exactly what you needed to be able to be able to do it. But not to especially to do it well, to be great, just to be able to do it. So you'll find this if you just turn to these um media type videos. But I think that it's a, again it will be one chapter. Finished. One chapter calligraphy, one chapter painting. That's the way it works. And then you, if you want to go any more than that, you go to the science side of the way. And you'll find information there. That. You deserve a copyright. Do we have a copyright? We do. You deserve it. You've got a wonderful audience. Thank you. <laughs>